Hi, I'm Dave Cross. Welcome to this class on restoring memories, where we're going to look at different techniques to restore old photographs. This is one of my favorite things to do, especially when it comes to working with photos from my family, looking at heirloom photos that I have received that in some cases are in bad shape, some cases just need a little bit of help and seeing the end result and then sharing that with other people, other family members in particular, and seeing their reaction when they look at them. So before we jump in too far, I want to talk about a couple of things. So just to give you an overview, what we're going to do in this next 45 minutes or so is talk a little bit about some overall concepts to be aware of when we're getting into the world of restoration. Then we're going to talk about capture how to capture your images in the best way. And then we'll look at some specific examples along the way of dealing with particular problems. Now, one of the realities of photo restoration is it takes time. And unfortunately, one of the drawbacks to many people sharing their results is, in my opinion, they're missing one important thing. And what I mean by that is they show a before and after. Great. I mean, that's, that's awesome to see the results of what you've been able to do. Unfortunately, typically they don't tell you how long that took. So my worry is that many people who don't know Photoshop and don't know how things work will look at that before and after and go, oh, cool, I'll get my friend, insert your name here, to fix this photo. And then they give you an envelope of a photo in 18 pieces. Well, what I wish people would do is they would do a before and after and put before and then after six hours, after eight hours, after four hours, whatever the time is, just so people realize it's not a five minute job. And that's one of the things I want to talk about right up front is realistic expectations for yourself and anyone you're doing the work for. It's one of the hardest things to do, especially if you're trying to do this as a, a paid situation, is estimating how long something will take. Obviously, like anything over time, you'll get better at it. But initially, it can be very difficult to look at a photograph and say, A, can I fix this? And B, how much time will it take? So the other part of it is I've had people give me a photograph and say, can you restore this photo? And it's an old photo, but it's just out of focus. I mean, at the time it was taken, it was not in focus. So just like a photo taken today on a digital camera is you can maybe sharpen a little bit, but it'll never be the same. It's kind of the same thing there. So go into this with eyes wide open and have realistic expectations of how much time and effort may be required. Now, having said that, in this session, because of this, I'm probably not going to finish entire images. I'm going to show you a process for example, how to remove spots. And I won't remove every single spot on the photograph because there's really no point in you sitting there watching me for 40 minutes while I sit there and remove a bunch of dots and tears. So we're, uh, it may be like those cooking shows where you know they put a dish in the oven and then five seconds later they go, and it's finished. You know, we, we might do a little bit of that maybe along the way so you can see an end result. But the main thing I want to show you is techniques that you can use. All right, let's talk about capture. And my personal feeling is if you're going to get into doing photo restoration even a little bit, then a scanner is a good idea. It's not necessary completely. I mean, I've seen people who create nice setups with two lights and a camera on a on a tripod stand or something to capture images. And that's that's fair enough. You certainly can. But one of the reasons I like this particular scanner is it does both regular photos as well as slides and negatives. So it actually has an attachment where you, when you open the lid, you take off and the light comes from behind and then you can actually scan slides and negatives. So that can be very, very useful. And one of the reasons that I like it in particular is because when you're scanning something very small and need to enlarge it quite a bit bigger, you need quite a bit of resolution. Could you get that from your camera? Probably, but then your focus has to be dead on and it, and maybe you can get that done. So I'll leave it up to you, uh, obviously, as to whether you think a scanner is right for you. This scanner was not very expensive and I've been very happy with it. It does everything I need. It happens to be an Epson uh, Perfection V600 photo and I'm not suggesting this is the model that you want. I'm not 
you know, endorsing it other than to say I've had very good success with it and, and not been disappointed. The software that comes with it is very basic, but that's okay. Its role is to get it into Photoshop. But here's an example of why having a scanner is useful. Look at the size of this photo. This was from, I'm looking at the back, it says 1921. And I guess this was the type of camera film they had back then. I'm going to show it to the other camera so I can zoom in hopefully on a little bit. So with photos this size, we need to enlarge it quite a bit during the scanning, which means we need a lot of resolution to be able to do that. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. The other thing I want to share with you, though, is something that happened to me when I first started working with all these images that I had inherited, including many, many slides. And of course, slides are very small. So these slides had been in uh, my family's possession in cupboards inside of one of those cases with a nice cover. So I got my slide attachment and I scanned in a slide and I'll show it to you actually. So here it is, let me zoom in to 100% and you can see, boy, there's a lot of dust on there. Unfortunately, it looks like the photograph is a little out of focus. So I happen to have on my shelf this a can of aerosol cleaning duster. So I just took my slide and <laughs> Threw it on the floor. Let me try that again. Cleaned it off. Scanned it again. And look at the difference. This is the exact same slide. Look what happened. Not only was there a lot less dust, including in some very important areas, but it's actually more in focus. And I realized that when you have a lot of dust or dirt on the image that you're scanning, then in effect, that's what it's focusing on. So it's just a little bit soft focus as you saw there. So this has been a very valuable addition. And I use this for both slides as well as photographs, trying to get rid of extra dust that I don't need. I also decided to get myself a pair of gloves when I was handling files because I didn't want to add anything more like fingerprints. Now I realize afterwards these are kind of inexpensive and I've found since then that there are better ones that are 100% cotton that aren't going to add any dust or anything like that. So let's talk first of all, I guess next because we've already talked about a few things, about figuring out if you do have a tiny photograph like this and you want to be able to ultimately work on it and print it nice and big like an 8x10 or a 9x13 or something like that, how do you figure out how to scan this and make sure you get the results that you want? Well, I use Photoshop as a calculator. So here's how we do it. We can close these files and I'm going to make a new document. And what I'm going to do in here is put in the final size that I want. So I'm gonna say 13 inches by nine inches and have the resolution at 240 because that's what I use for my printer. I could make it 300 if I want to, but I know that on my printer, 240 is enough. And then I hit create. So all we need to do is create this new document. It doesn't matter whether it's transparent or white, it's really just the physical size. So then I go to the image menu to image size. I make sure that resample image is unchecked. So these three values are linked together. And then I measure the photograph or the element that I'm actually scanning, which in this case, this small photograph is just under two inches wide. So that tells me if you want to be able to scan this in and enlarge it to a nine by 13, you're gonna to have to scan it at 1782 pixels per inch. So that means I need to have a lot of information. So now I know when I go to my scanner, these are the values. So I'd probably scan it at, I don't know, 2000 just to be safe. As a general rule, I like to scan things higher than I need, even if I'm not enlarging it quite as much as this, even if the originals are relatively big, when it comes to dealing with issues we're trying to 
work on and improve, the closer you can zoom in at a good quality, the better it's going to be. Now, I wouldn't go overboard and scan things at a huge high resolution, like some crazy high number, because then it's going to slow you down. But a lot of the time, for me anyway, I'm finding a lot of time I'm working with grayscale images, which means even at a high resolution, the file size is not that big. So that's one of the things we can do to try and deal with that. So use Photoshop as this kind of calculator idea so that if you're trying to estimate how high a resolution should I scan to be able to give myself the end result that I want, that can do a great job. Now, just before we start looking at some, uh, some specific techniques, I do want to mention one other thing about a scanner is it occurred to me that scanning photographs and negatives is fine, but when I was working on a project, I came across on eBay this person who had a collection of all these little gears from watches and things like that. And because they're very flat, I realized I could also scan things like this and incorporate them into my artwork as well. So don't limit yourself by thinking, well, photos, slides, negatives, anything that's relatively flat, even something like a pencil or a pair of scissors, you could potentially scan because they still have a relatively shallow uh, depth of field went for as far as a scanner is concerned. So keep that in mind as, as an extra. Now, there will be occasions where you can't use a scanner, even if you have one, and one of those is when you have a photograph behind glass and you don't want to risk removing it because it, sometimes I've seen ones where it almost looks like the photo is has been stuck to the glass. So if you open, try to take the photograph out, you could risk damaging it. Well, photographing a photograph, something, a print behind glass can be very challenging. So here's a, a tip that I realized that could work very well thanks to Photoshop. So here's an example. This one, I didn't actually have one with glass, but I you can still see some reflections were happening because this photograph has a very shiny surface. So even for something like that, even if it's not behind a frame, it still is going to have an impact. So trying to scan it and or photograph it without getting a reflection was very challenging. So instead, I did this. I took the photograph, but I deliberately took it on an angle. And it doesn't really matter too much the angle other than do it so you don't see any reflections and just be sure you're not cutting off any of the photograph. And then we just go to our perspective crop tool and you can just click and kind of follow the corners here. I'll just adjust that one a little bit. I could zoom in even closer if I wanted to, but this will be fine for our purposes. And then you hit enter and it straightens it up. And look at that, no reflection of any kind. Now, if I needed to, of course, I could switch to the regular crop tool because I want to just get a little closer. Make sure I'm not adding any unnecessary elements. And that's a, a tip I'll probably mention again is if you can crop, because sometimes you might have a photograph that has just extra unnecessary information, then this is one way around it. And one last idea about scanning, if you're capturing something and you have a photograph like this that's pretty big, and on the one hand, it probably would fit in the scan, just barely, boy, it just barely makes it. But I'd be concerned that because of that, I'd be restricted a little bit in terms of resolution because I just can't get quite as close in. So in cases like this, where it either barely fits or particularly ones that just don't fit on the scanner lid, then consider scanning it in a couple of pieces. So you're gonna end up with two halves, or could be even more, I suppose, depending on the size, and then using Photoshop to put the pieces back together again. Looks like this. So here you can see the two halves of the photo. And all I did was I made sure I looked at a person and made sure they were in both. So I made sure there was a good overlap here. And then this is in Bridge, by the way. You could do this just from within Photoshop, but I like to look at them here. You select both of them. And then in Bridge, I can choose Photoshop, load files into Photoshop layers. And that just saves me having to 
open both files and then drag one on top of the other. And then I just need to drag one of these to the left or right, whichever you want. And then I can go to the image menu and choose reveal all. I think it'll be easier in this particular case based on where just to put the right side on top. And then I'm gonna just do a quick estimate of where it should be, but rather than me do the work, I'll let Photoshop do it. Select both layers and under the edit menu, choose auto align layers. And then you'll see it does a really nice job. Now it, it does look like it moved them ever so slightly, but the important thing is if I scroll around, even if we know that's where the edge was, there's really no difference here. And by the way, one other nice advantage of a scanner is you don't have to worry about settings like, oh, did I have it on manual or automatic exposure and risk having images that look different because the scanner is always going to scan it the same way every single time. Now, typically, if you've seen any of my classes, including the one I did at the very beginning of the summit talking about working non-destructively, I'm always the one saying, don't merge, don't flatten, things like that. But we have to be more realistic when we're talking about things like photo restoration. Would there be any reason for me to preserve the two separate halves on a photograph like this as I continue to work on it? Probably not. So in a case like this, I would certainly consider merging the two layers together because, well, A, I know I have the original half should I need them, so I would save this under a different name. But as I mentioned, B, there's really no worry or concern about me saying, I need to go, might have to go back to that version, like just one half of the photograph. So I'm a lot, it's a lot more likely you'll hear me in this class talk about things like merging layers and things like that because of the nature of what we're working on. So as we scroll around this photograph, you can see again, it did a really nice job of putting things together. So now I could press command or control E to merge down. And then I could, if this was a real project, I would save a copy under a different name so I can continue working on it. All right, we have one last thing I wanna talk about from a capture related standpoint, and that is Sometimes you have photographs like this one that actually has, I can feel there's some texture in the paper. And when you scan that, often it shows up as sort of a bumpiness that can be hard to deal with. I wanna show you a couple of what I would call potential strategies for dealing with this. And I say it that way because every texture is different and these are techniques that I found work well with this photo and a few others might not always work with what you're doing, but to me, it's worth a shot because trying these techniques could eliminate a lot of work. And the first one is putting the photograph on the scanner on an angle. So we're putting it on angle and then in Photoshop, we're gonna put it back. So I open the angled photograph and then with my crop tool, I just go up to the options bar where there's the straighten tool and then drag along what should be straight. It's gonna straighten it and then I can do any additional cropping that I need to do. And I can still see a very slight texture here and there, but it's not as bad. I realized I didn't have the original to show you the first time I scanned it, so I apologize for that, but there was a bit more of a noticeable texture. So the other strategy that I've tried and it worked real, relatively well to scan two versions of it, one right side up and the other one flipped upside down. So I'm gonna take both of these images and once again, use Photoshop, I should say tools in Bridge Photoshop, load files into Photoshop layers. And once again, if you don't use Bridge, you can certainly open them both in Photoshop and manually add them together. So now I have the two images I'm gonna take the bottom one, which is flipped, and I'm going to go and flip vertical, and then flip horizontal. So now I have two versions. You can see because I scanned them separately, they're not exactly the same. So once again, I wanna select them both and choose auto align layers. So now 
the important part, which is that our subjects line up perfectly. So the theory behind this idea is because they, one was scanned facing up the right way and the other one was upside down, is if there was any bumpiness created by the light of the scanner, then we're kind of altering it. So now there's a couple of things we can do. One would be to simply lower the opacity of the top layer so the bottom layer shows through. And if there was any bumpy texture, this might deal with it. Again, it's kind of hard to see in this example. The other one that I tried and, and thought this has interesting possibilities, and it's a little more complicated, but it's worth showing you, is to take both layers. So once they've already been aligned, then we're going to convert to a smart object. And once you've done that, under the layer menu, there is an option called, under smart objects, stack modes. And one of them is called median, which is like taking an average between the two. And when I tried that the first time, I could see a noticeable difference between them. Now, at this point, I still haven't done any actual retouching to areas that need to be fixed. So one thing to keep in mind is if you do do a smart object like this, then it becomes a little more challenging to do any retouching. So you might want to, once again, if, if you feel this is been a positive move that's helped you to consider, and I, and I have a hard time actually saying this out loud because I'm usually the one saying, don't ever do this. But if you rasterize the layer, it converts it back to a regular pixel layer, and then you can continue retouching directly on here. So normally I would say, please don't do that on when you're working with smart objects. But again, as we said at the beginning, restoration working on these type of projects is a the one exception, okay, it's a different way of working. And I mean, you could continue working on it on a separate layer like you would with normal smart objects or a smart object typically and with most photos, but it adds just a bit more complexity than we really need in a case like this. Oh, one thing I, I should mention, I, I want to mention earlier, but I'll mention it now. If you're a VIP member, I, there will be examples of many of these images that you can download so you can try some of these techniques yourself. So with that being said, let's jump in and talk about some specific techniques to work on images. And I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm not going to go through a, a beginning to end restoration of any one photograph because there are, it would just, like I said, after a while, you'd be like, yep, he's just removed another spot. Yay. So instead, I'm going to show you the basic techniques and then cut to the chase and move on to the next one. So the first thing I'm going to suggest to you is one of the best places to start is camera raw. And I know that sounds really weird to say that because we talk camera raw is a raw processing software, but there are just some techniques or some tools in camera raw that simply don't exist in Photoshop. Number one being ones like dehaze. Dehaze was introduced to deal with fog and haze in a photograph, but when you look at an old faded photograph, hmm, looks almost kind of foggy. So. I'm going to suggest that a great place to start is camera raw. It's not going to fix every problem, but in many cases, it's going to give you a jump start to really getting close towards what you want. Now, because we're typically scanning as either TIFF or JPEG, we can't just double click on a file and get into camera raw. So we have to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to close all these files and not save them. And then go back to bridge and let's start with this one. When you want to work in camera raw, you have two options. One of them, in this case, I'm going to show you first, I've already opened it in Photoshop, and then I can apply the camera raw filter. Now, a decision you have to make here, and it's kind of similar to what we just talked about, is are you willing to do this in one shot, or do you want the ability to come back and try a few things? If you feel like you might want to experiment a little bit, then we should convert for smart filters and when you do that, it means now the camera raw filter will be editable. And as I'll mention, that has pros and cons to it. So now we'll go to the filter menu, camera raw filter. It goes into the camera raw interface. And we can, for example, take dehaze. I mean, look at that. That's just crazy to me how good a job that does so quickly. So it does darken things a little bit. So we might want to pull the exposure up. I like to put a bit of clarity in there to help with 
just bringing out a bit more detail and maybe even a bit of negative texture to try and deal with all the little bits and pieces. So that's a great start. And the other thing that I typically do is go to detail and choose noise reduction. And that will deal with a lot of the small little bits and pieces of dust and the little tiny scratches. Obviously it won't do anything with these larger ones, but just to show you the difference, let's click OK. And you can see here's the Camera Raw Smart Filter. I'm going to turn it off. Here's my original and here's now. I mean, that's, that's a really good start very quickly. Now, the challenge is if now I went to say, okay, cool, let me start working with a tool like the Spot Healing Brush, then you'll see I have a problem because when you get this symbol, if I try to work on it, it's prompting me to rasterize a smart object, which as you saw before, means that it takes away any ability to edit it. So our options would be to go ahead and do that and lose the ability to keep editing here or add a blank layer above and just make sure that the healing brush and spot healing brush have sample all layers turned on. And now as we go through and start working on these noticeable areas, what it's going to do if we hide our bottom layer, it's generating these pixels and putting them on the layer above. Now there's something to be said for working this way because at least it means if you do a whole bunch of work and notice a glaring mistake, you can still fix it. However, here's the one thing you need to know that's very important because it might not be obvious at first glance. You might be thinking, I'm gonna do all this work here. And now that I look at it again, I might wanna do some extra work on the camera raw filter, but look what happens when I do that. If you double click, and say, let's just go and make it obvious by lowering the exposure. Just change, I'll just change a couple things and then click OK. The problem is the photograph updates, but the spots do not. And so you have to really think about the order in which you do things. Now, let me take a step back here. I'm going to close this document. Now, I realized that as I went to show you what I was going to show you, this is a PSD file. So let me instead take one of my, find one of my JPEGs. If I single click on it and then right click, I can choose open in camera raw. I could also press command or control R, and this is going to actually open it right in raw. It still ends up being the same idea. The difference is then you open it in Photoshop and it will have those raw settings applied. So it's just a couple of different ways of getting to the same and result. I just want to show you one other example because it's just so crazy to me what a great job this does as a start. I'm going to open this in Camera Raw and once again do the same kind of things. Dehaze, increase the exposure a little bit, maybe in this case contrast, give the blacks a little boost. And then Go into detail, do some noise reduction. Maybe that's a little much. Now, one of the questions that often comes up when people see me doing this and say, you've just done the same thing, basically repeated the same operation, is could I make a preset in Camera Raw? And while you could, every photograph you're going to work with is a little bit different. So the decision you'll have to make is, is it worth having a preset for three or four of these settings, knowing that the chances are you're gonna to have to alter each settings per image. So you could make a preset in Camera Raw, apply it, and then go and edit the settings. That's fine. I find that even though I'm using the same core of functions, a lot of the time the settings are hardly ever the same. So for me, it's just as quick to um, apply the same settings one at a time per image. But I wanted to at least address that because I've had a few people mention about or ask about the whole idea of what about presets. All right, let's start now looking at some specific issues now that we've talked about different ways of capturing our image and getting them into, getting ready to edit them in Photoshop. So let's now look at some specific issues, including the first one of dust and scratches. Let's cancel that and let's open this one in Photoshop. 
Now, in this particular case, I'm going to start in Photoshop before I do anything else in terms of exposure and things like that, because I find it distracting to have all of these bits of dust here. So let's go to 100% view. You can see there's lots of, it's kind of a weird dust in this case, because it looks dark. It's almost like ink splatters or something, but that's the way it is. So I have a couple of options. Of course, I could use the spot healing brush, make sure it's set to content aware. And I'm using a tablet, which means even though you can see my brush size is quite big, I'm using the pressure sensitivity to make sure that I'm using a size of brush just a little bit bigger than I need. So this is, of course, an option. But one of the potential problems is, and I don't, we're not going to necessarily run into it here, but I'll just show you, is that if there's areas where the dots are so close together, the way that the spot healing brush works is it looks at nearby areas to generate the pixels. And if there are, everything is so close together, it might just try and cover up your spot with another spot. So another option, so the spot healing brush, yes, definitely great. And we'll, we'll use it for lots of things throughout the rest of the class. But I want to show you an alternate choice here. I'm going to once again convert for smart filters. We need to do this in this case for this to work. And then I'm going to go to the filters under noise to dust and scratches. And there's two settings in here, radius and pixel. So let's put them both back to their minimum, which means not much will happen. So what I want to do is try and find the lowest number I can use for radius until the dots are gone, the scratches and little bits of dust. And I can use the arrow key, up arrow key. And I'm going to worry mostly about the smaller ones. So it seems like around 9 or 10. And then with a threshold, I want to put it as high as I can without the dots appearing. Now, don't worry what it does right now to the rest of the photograph. So before I move the threshold, it looked all out of focus, but that's okay because we're not done yet. So I'm going to put the threshold up too high and then start to back it down. And I want to find a number where I can see the dots have disappeared. So this takes a bit of getting used to it. I'm not in any way suggesting use these numbers because, of course, it will depend on your photograph. But the bottom line is we want the radius to be as low as it can be and the threshold to be as high as it can be. And sometimes it'll be like this where the radius is higher than the threshold. But you can play around with those numbers. Click OK. And then in the smart filter, we're going to invert the mask. So Command or Control I to fill it with black. So now what we've done is we have a filter that's completely hidden. So now if I tap B for my brush, I want to make sure on my settings up here, it's 100% opacity. I want the brush size to be much smaller. I want to make sure white is my foreground color. So I'll hit X to make sure my foreground color is white. So let's look at the setup I have. I've done the dust and scratches filter. I've made the mask black, and now my paintbrush is loaded with white paint. So in a way, I suppose you could think what I'm doing is now I'm painting with the dust and scratches filter. So wherever I paint, I'm going to be applying the dust and scratches filter, but because of the settings I chose, that will hopefully remove the majority of them really quickly and easily. Now, depending on where you are, you don't have to necessarily just do like I'm doing here, like click once, click once, and so on. Let's scroll down a bit here. Because this area is a pretty solid color, I could uh, potentially just paint all over areas like this. And because it's a mask, if you were doing this and by mistake went in the wrong place and got rid of a scratch or maybe a piece of dust that just didn't work so well, then just press X and paint to say, okay, I'm gonna have to use some other approach for that and then hit X again and continue. So once again, I'm not gonna do the whole thing because that would, after a while, you'd be like, yep, like I said, there goes another, another piece of dust, although it is kind of addicting and 
very rewarding <laughs> to do this. Now, one tip I want to give you while I think of it is when you're doing anything like this, like painting or cloning or spot healing or anything like that that involves you painting, think about rather than painting a big long area, do it in pieces. And the reason I say that is here's the potential problem. If I take, for example, my spot healing brush and go like this and do a big long brush stroke and then it heals everything and there's a bit of a problem here, I have to undo the whole thing. Whereas if I went heal, 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 sounds like I'm giving instructions to my dog, but you know what I mean, heal, heal. So that way, if I make a mistake, I just have to undo the last little piece. Now, it will depend a little bit on the tool you're using because tools like the healing brush as opposed to spot healing generally works better if you do actually cover up an entire area rather than doing just a little piece, which you might see that little dark blurriness that you normally get. So I like this method because it eliminates any worry over the healing tools not picking from the right spot. All right, so let's assume for a moment we've taken the dish out of the oven and it's all nicely baked and all of our dots are gone. Okay, I have to take that one away, sorry. <laughs> now I wanna go into camera raw, but now I've got a bit of a problem. Because I made this a smart filter and I painted on the mask, one of the challenges of working with smart filters is only one mask. So for in other words, if I clicked on my image and went to the camera raw filter, and I'll just do something really obvious you can see, I'm lightening up everything dramatically, which of course I wouldn't do, I just wanna show you what happens. The problem is it uses the same mask, so it's only lightening the same areas that I covered up with my spots. So clearly that is not gonna work. So at this point, once again, we're faced with a decision. Option A would be to rasterize a smart object and in effect apply this, meaning you can't go and edit it any further, which you might be fine with because you might be have said, yep, I've addressed every single problem I need to, and that's fine. The other option, which sounds a little more complicated at first glance, this is already a smart object, but if I right click on it and choose convert to smart object, I'm making a smart object from this smart object. So embedded inside this smart object is the original, and I'll explain that further in a moment. So now, if I go to the camera raw filter, and say I wanna do a little bit of dehaze, and I want some more contrast, maybe put the exposure up just a little bit, but keep the shadows nice. A bit more clarity, maybe. And then, oh, and I wanna also go to detail and do just a bit of noise reduction and then click OK. So you can see now I've done that, but oops, I forgot about this scratch. I didn't really. Now I want to get back to the smart filter where I can adjust this. So this smart object here, if I double click on it, it opens up a separate window with this original one I was working on. So now I could come in here and work with this. If it doesn't quite work, I might need to go with the healing brush. So I add a new layer, go to my spot healing brush. Let's actually zoom in closer. Get this looking a little better. We're going to talk more about tears and scratches in a moment. But now if I save this document and close it, it's going to update in the other documents, still apply the camera raw filter, but now this has been updated to reflect the change that I made. Now, personally, that's my preference just because I'm very comfortable working with smart objects. If you just watched that and went, say what now? This takes a bit of getting used to because working with a smart object can always be a little bit confusing at first. Putting a smart object inside another smart object, even though it solves this problem, does add a bit of complexity. So that's why I mentioned that you could simply rasterize, work on the camera raw the way, uh, just a normal way, but then if you did see any other spots or dust you'd missed, you'd have to just do those manually. So again, it's, it's a personal choice. And speaking of tears and things like that, let's now look at what happens if you have a photograph that is torn in two or more. So I have this image here, which I'm gonna open up. 
and you can see it definitely has a tear in it. Now, when this was scanned in, I didn't even try to make the pieces match up. I just said, let's just get fairly close. So I'll use the quick selection tool to make a selection. And ideally, what I want to do is get just the photograph, not the paper edge, because that's the paper from the underside of this piece, nor do I want the shadow that this scanner introduced. This is an older scan from a different scanner. But that overall looks pretty good. Now, if I really wanted to, I could get even more detail and say, get rid of that part, get rid of that part. But for now, I'm going to say that that looks pretty good there. Now, rather than just duplicate this, which would introduce a new problem, because if I did that, when I went to move the piece up, I would see the original underneath. I'm going to go to the layer menu and choose new layer via cut. So that's going to cut it off the background and put it on its own layer. Now I can tap V for my move tool and try to get this start to match up. And I'm just looking at first at one side to see how that is. And you see I can get relatively close there. So now I'll go to free transform, command and control T. But one of the things that can make a big difference, especially when you have one edge that's matched up pretty well, is to take this reference point, which always is in the center, and move it right to where those pieces match up, then go to the opposite side. And now when I drag up, it looks like it's going to match up pretty well. Let's zoom in a little closer, 100%, Command and Control 1. And I'm looking at the edge of this chair, so I'm just going to nudge with my arrow key, maybe just a little bit. I'm just looking at other edges to see that looks like a pretty good match there and there. Okay, so good. So I'm going to hit enter. And once again, in this case, I don't know that there's any real reason for me to keep these two pieces. So I'm going to merge down. And now I can use the spot healing brush. So once again, the choice you have to make is, are you okay with just healing directly on the what is now the background image, which I would say most of the time is fine. If you're in areas like faces and other detail, you might consider adding a new layer. And again, making sure it says sample all layers so that when you're doing work in this sort of area, you have a bit more of a safety net. So if you've done something and then when you look at it later on, you don't really like it as much. I don't like that one. you can continue to edit. So spacebar is our friend to get the hand tool so we don't have to leave what we're doing and go to the scroll bars. Again, I'm not gonna do the whole thing, but that's the basic idea to get you started. Obviously we can do some cropping this would be another example I talked about before where I don't know that there's any compelling reason to have all that headroom on this photograph. I want to focus on the subject and crop it. And now that I've done that, I could say, okay, if I'm happy with the way the face works, I could merge down that blank layer and now do the camera raw work we talked about before. Now, as I expected would happen, even though I said I wouldn't spend too much time on each photo, I still spend a little too much time, so I'm running a little short of time. So just wanna to touch on a few other areas. If you have images with faded colors, once again, I would start in camera raw because dehaze also can work miracles on a photograph where the colors are very faded. I did wanna talk about one specific instance because it's a little out there, but it's been a real game changer for me. And that is what do you do when you have photographs where something is either missing or covered up completely? For example, this photograph, there's a piece missing and also something happened on here. So his hand is just covered up as is part of his head and ear. So first of all, when you have a piece missing like this, Let's see what our friend Content-Aware Phil can do. And you can see it's 
pretty darn good. It's not perfect, but it certainly would be distracting enough that I don't think anyone who came across this photo would look up there and go, the curtains don't look quite right. I mean, they look pretty good. I might have to do a little bit of work with the folds, but that's not bad at all. But what about things like this where, let's zoom in here, the that information is just gone. So one of the things that I started doing a long time ago, and I'll show you an example of this, is, and it's gonna sound really strange to say this, but I started collecting body parts in Photoshop, that is. So if I'm working on a photograph and I go, wow, that arm or hand or ear or face or smile is really good, I'm gonna just copy it and paste it into a document that I have all the time filled with all these different parts on different layers. I know it sounds really weird, but it works. So let me go and show you what I mean by that. Here's an example of an image that has all kinds of parts in it. And for example, if I take my move tool, I can command click and go, okay, that's this layer. And boy, I was actually did a re relatively good job of actually naming all these layers so I could know what it is. So now we'll take this, drag and drop it into our wedding photo. It's a little small and normally I'd be reluctant to enlarge something, but in this case, it's really my only choice. So I'm going to hit free transform, position it on top and then lower the opacity so I can see the original and then scale it up a little bit. I think that looks relevant. Of course, you could, if you needed to, you could rotate, etc. put the opacity back. And then what we do is we're gonna add a layer mask filled with black. So Option or Alt, click on the Add Layer Mask button. Take our brush tool and start to paint in where we need the hand to show and we're going to try and use just the bare amount of detail here now it looks like i wasn't still wasn't quite big enough so i'm going to unlink those two hit free transform option or alt and just enlarge a little bit and finally add a levels adjustment layer that i'm going to clip using this button so it only affects this hand layer because i feel like it needs to be a little bit darker to match what we had. So let's take a look and see. I mean, it's a pretty good match. And here's the other thing. And if you zoom back out again, obviously I'd have to also deal with that part there, but let's look at the difference. I mean, it's acceptable. So as odd as it sounds to say, collect body parts, it can be a real time saver because frankly, what else are you gonna do? I mean, Content Aware Fill is great, but it's not gonna generate an ear <laughs> unless there was some ears floating around. So, you know, that's, that's one of the ways to really take advantage of Photoshop's ability is to go in and build up your own little collection of bits and pieces that you can use. And I know, it, again, it sounds weird, but when you think about it, what's the alternative? It, it's You can't generate something is not a filter that says make ear or fill in nose or something like that. So, but the key is, and I, I wanna stress this, if you copy someone else's nose and their eyes over, use the eyes to match up. But if all that's missing is part of someone's nose, then add that layer mask, fill with black and just paint the bare minimum in you need and that way it'll blend in better because that way you're still preserving as much of the detail as you can. So hopefully this has given you a few ideas. There's a ton more we could talk about in restoring photos, but these were the key things that I wanted to touch on, especially spending some time on the capture side because my feeling is too many people just jump in and they start restoring a photograph with not enough resolution to really do the trick. So understanding how that all works, I think is very important. So hopefully you enjoy this, got some ideas from it. As I mentioned, VIP members can download some of these files to try some of these things for yourself. Thanks so much for watching.